In this environmental and resource economics video, I'll be talking about externalities and market failure. So let's get right into it. Okay, what I'll be covering specifically, I'm going to start out by talking about revenue and costs and profit, give you an overview of that. Then I'll be getting into externalities and explaining what those are in relation to overuse of resources and pollution. And that uh, itself will relate to private costs and benefits and social costs and benefits. And then I'll be uh, finishing up by talking about a couple of different policy interventions to address market failures. So let's start out by a, a quick discussion of revenue, cost, and profit. So I have a more in-depth discussion about uh, the marginal cost curve and how it relates to the supply curve in another video. Uh, but just something that I don't have in that video that I want to briefly mention here is the relationship between revenue and cost and profit and really maybe at two different levels. One, total revenue, and total cost and total profit, and the other, marginal revenue and marginal cost and marginal profit. So I'm purposefully stacking these two graphs on top of each other. So you notice they both have this dollar sign on the left, which is for cost and revenue and so on. And they both have quantity across the bottom. So let's look at the top one to begin with. And in fact, I'm going to start with total revenue, which is this uh, curve here. So what is the total revenue? Well, it is the amount of money that the firm receives. Um, it's effectively the price of, of each product that they sell times the quantity of the products that they sell. So total revenue is price times quantity. Um, the total cost then here you can see has this kind of funny shape and it would be easy for me to kind of get technical and uh, and uh, lose everybody here. Um, so maybe I just want to focus on a few things. There is more detail on this in the other video if you're interested. Uh, but effectively, um, total costs initially start above zero uh, once um, production, even, even if the firm is not producing, because there's a certain number of fixed costs that occur in terms of um, you know, salaries that have to be paid even if the firm's not producing anything, and insurance, and bank loans, and um, all of that type of thing. So even if there's no output at all, there are certain costs that are, that are occurred right away. Um, the marginal cost curve here, this, this curve here and the way that it, it kind of goes up and then, you know, comes around like that is in fact directly related to, to this curve underneath the marginal curve. And if you enjoy math, or maybe not, but you're interested, um, the, the marginal curve is the uh, first derivative of the uh, total cost curve here. So what that really means is um, the first derivative is the slope of the curve. So the slope of this curve at any particular point, so at a particular quantity point here, the slope of the curve um, is reflected here. So what this is saying is that the slope and you can see, if you imagine you had a line um, that was tangential to this, is initially falling. It is getting less steep as we go up in this direction, and that is why the marginal costs are dropping here. Then it plateaus off, and that really relates to um, this area here, where the um, where the slope is uh, not changing. And then as you go around here, you can see that the slope actually begins to increase again. And that's why this marginal cost curve is going up like that. So what is that uh, really saying? So you may recall that the marginal cost is the cost of producing an additional unit. And the kind of principles and concepts behind the nature of this curve here is that uh, due to this condition or principle of um, diminishing marginal productivity, and you can all refer back to a previous lecture, uh, that um, costs are initially falling as we get synergies from uh, workers uh, and or whatever the variable factor of production is, and then um, they uh, uh, begin to rise after that. So I'm not going to go too much into detail here. Uh, and the supply curve is effectively this upward sloping section of the marginal cost curve. So maybe enough said about that for now.
So uh, just before I kind of uh, go on then, what is the marginal revenue? So that is the amount of money that the firm receives for each additional sale. And really that is equal to price in a competitive market. So if the firm sells another unit, they get the, pr the sales price of that. So marginal revenue is equal to the, um, to the price. Uh, marginal cost upward sloping here, in fact, is uh, equal to the supply curve. So let's consider then how, where is the firm making profit? And profit is the difference between revenue and cost. So um, the total revenue then is the total amount um, that the firm sells times the price, total revenue, minus the sum of all of the marginal costs and that equals their total profit, the total revenue minus total costs. And the, so let's have a look at what that is on this diagram here. So you can see, think of it at this point. At this point here, for example, total costs are above total revenue. Total costs are greater than total revenue. So the firm in this situation, wherever this cost curve is above this total revenue curve, the firm will be losing money. They will be making negative profits. They'll be losing money here. So this section here, all of this area in here, uh, the firm is losing money. Well, let's look over here. So in this section, you can see that the total revenue is above total cost. So for this area of the diagram, in fact, that would relate to this range of quantities here, the firm is making profit. And then we get to this section of quantities out here, where once again, total revenue is less than total cost, and the firm is um, losing money there, making negative profits. So where should the firm operate? Well, I guess we could take another look here uh, and the marginal costs, and that really kind of is where our interest lies in the whole thing. So you might conclude that the firm should operate perhaps up here somewhere. Well, I don't know, let's have a look at that. So at a point like that, at that intersection, total cost exactly equals total revenue. So what that's saying is that all of the money that the firm brings in from sales is exactly offset by all of their costs. So they make no profit. Similarly here, they make no profit. So somewhere they want to be operating in this range, uh, where revenue is greater than cost. And in fact, the uh, specific quantity that they want to be operating at is here, where there's the greatest difference between revenue and cost. This is the largest, of course, we're subtracting one from the other. That is, you know, total profit is total revenue minus cost. So the bigger the difference here, the greater the revenue compared to the cost, the bigger the total profit. So that's the profit maximizing quantity of output for the firm. And it's worth noting, really, it is by no accident, and indeed it's very important uh, to understand that that is the point uh, where marginal cost equals marginal revenue. So just to belabor the point, um, the profit maximizing quantity of output for the firm is the spot where marginal cost equals marginal revenue. So let's have a look at that in a bit more detail. So here I've just kind of gone for a bit of a simpler diagram, got rid of all the total costs and so on, and focused really on the marginal. And I'm looking at the marginal, as I said, the supply curve section, which is the upward sloping section of the marginal cost, technically above average cost, but let's not get uh, to wrapped up in that. So in this diagram then, how much should the firm produce? It's this question of what is the profit maximizing quantity of output? And here's really the rule that you can follow, which is if the revenue from the sale of another unit of the product is greater than the cost of producing it, then the firm should go ahead and do it and make it and sell it. Whereas if the cost, um, sorry, if the revenue from the sale is less than the cost to produce it, then it shouldn't make it and it shouldn't sell it. So let's look at how that works here. So for instance, at this quantity here, the revenue, marginal revenue, that's the price that the firm gets, is greater than the cost of making that particular unit. So the firm makes this much profit on that. That is the marginal profit uh, that for that particular unit. So they should make it. 
Well, what about over here? Well, once again, the price is still above the cost, so they should make that unit, and still above here, so they should make that unit. Well, what about over here? Well, here the cost of producing that unit is greater than what the firm can sell it for, so it shouldn't produce it. And by logic and reason and common sense, then we can determine that the profit maximizing quantity of output is exactly here at this point where marginal cost equals marginal revenue. So this whole area here then is the total profit and it is really made up of the sum of all of the marginal profits of uh, unit by unit going along here. So you can see that for instance this particular you know first unit has a very large difference between the cost of production of that unit and the sales price so there's a lot of marginal profit whereas somewhere over here there's um, higher costs uh, even for the same price so there's less marginal profit so should the firm you know make this unit when they just hardly get any profit at all well it's profit and uh, any profit is better than no profit so that's the profit maximizing maxim make as much as you can so here then, uh, I'll draw your attention to this, that is the total profit. And hence, um, from this previous diagram then, here you can see that the profit maximizing spot is um, you know, where total, total profit's the greatest and that is where the marginal revenue equals marginal cost. So what happens then if, for instance, the price of the product goes down? How would we represent that? Well, we'd show that by a downward movement here in the marginal revenue curve. So that's a decrease in the price, the marginal revenue curve shifts, and then how does the firm respond to that? Well, they respond by reevaluating the point of output, that profit maximizing output, and um, just adjusting it where the, you know, their marginal cost curve meets the new marginal revenue curve. And so where marginal cost equals marginal revenue, that's the profit maximizing output there. And you can see, you know, compared to the initial one, the, um, apologies, the uh, quantity there has decreased. The profit maximizing quantity has decreased and the overall amount of profit that the firm has uh, brought in has also decreased. So you know, obviously from a firm's perspective, they're not very excited about uh, falling prices. And this is, I should state, a competitive market situation where the firm is unable to influence the price that it receives. And obviously that's uh, pretty common in, in many markets. Um, the firm's effectively a price taker and they have to, they, they respond by providing um, as much into the market as their costs will allow. So what happens instead if there's a change in the cost curve? So in this case, I've got another marginal cost curve, marginal revenue curve here. Here's the profit. This is the equilibrium quantity produced, Q star to begin with. So if the marginal cost curve shifts down or to the right, so that might be due to a technological improvement or a decrease in um, the uh, one of the factor price of one of the factors of production or perhaps more suppliers something like that when the when the marginal cost curve comes down like that the firm reevaluates and says well you know well now what is the new point at which marginal costs equals marginal revenue and that's here and so you can see greater quantity and indeed greater profit so when the if a firm is able to reduce its marginal costs then uh, for the same price, it's able to make more profit and it will produce a greater quantity. Why? Because it can sell more now, um, because it can cover, you know, for that new quantity, it can cover the additional cost of production. So let's talk then maybe just about generally profit maximizing behavior and what we tend to see in the real world. So firms then are motivated to increase their total profit in these competitive markets where they can't affect the prevailing price. So they have an incentive then, of course, they're overjoyed when uh, prices go up and they have an incentive. They're motivated to try to find ways to reduce their costs, especially these marginal costs, 
um, because it increases their profits. And there's a lot of legitimate strategies they can they can undertake to do that. For instance, they could try to you know undertake research and development and try to come up with new production processes and technologies that reduce the cost of production. They can substitute high, you know, more expensive, high cost factors of production for lower cost substitutes. And that could be, for instance, um, highly skilled labor for less skilled labor. It might be, um, you know, one type of, instead of using rosewood, they're going to use pine instead, you know, substituting um, very expensive materials for less expensive materials. They can also seek efficiencies to try to increase the productivity, the marginal productivity of those factors of production. So perhaps they would go through a, a training program to improve the skill set of the workers they employ. And for the same wage that they're paying the workers, they would get more output from them. So those are examples of legitimate strategies. Unfortunately, it's um, of course not universal, but firms are motivated by profit. And one of the ways they can do that is by avoiding costs. And one of the ways they can avoid costs is unfortunately do things like illegally dispose of wastes or reduce their health and safety initiatives and measures or don't fully remediate sites where they've operated for example mining sites where they've done a lot of um, you know change to the landscape or they might choose less less expensive technologies that have greater risks of failure and when those um, technologies do fail then they end up causing uh, health and safety or environmental damage. So, and firms, other possibilities that they may do is kind of look um, rather, I don't know if you want to call it cold heartedly, but basically say um, they might risk the possibility of paying a fine, you know, doing something illegal and paying a fine uh, if they think. Uh, the chances of getting caught are not uh, really very high, or if they think the fine is not particularly expensive compared to the cost of um, the higher cost of production of following whatever the proper regime would be. So unfortunately, that's uh, one of the situations we encounter. And also we note that firms regularly lobby politicians to uh, not enact regulations that are going to impose costs on them. And all around the world, we see um, the pressure that um, the companies put on politicians. For example, you know, when a political party proposes to introduce a carbon tax, uh, they can be pretty certain that it's going to be met with stiff opposition and lobbying efforts from the fossil fuel industry and the automotive association and other um, groups that have an interest in avoiding costs. So here's a couple of examples. So Fukushima nuclear disaster, I'm sure you're probably familiar with that. A tsunami hit a, a power plant on the Japanese coast and inundated with water and the pump shut down and the uh, reactor went critical and, and it remains an enormous catastrophe that is um, effectively burning away uh, radioactively. Um, underneath uh, the uh, in the plant um, covered with water and is just uh, leaking that back into the ocean so that in fact I mean so here's a here's an article that comes from I believe the Japanese Times and uh, so there some study then really effectively research has said that the cost savings measures were partly to blame for the situation of course the tsunami was uh, totally um, unavoidable uh, but the nature of the construction of the site had something to do with the damage that actually occurred and specifically when the site was built a decision was made uh, about the the overall banks that were around the site and you can see them in the, in some of these pictures to actually reduce the height of the bank uh, where the pump was located because they did a cost-benefit analysis and found that um, the closer that the pump was to sea level, the less its operating cost would be. So really, fundamentally, a cost savings measure led them to lower the banks. They underestimated the possibility of a large tsunami. And so when it did occur, uh, came over the bank, flooded the entire area, and we had uh, you know terrible nuclear disaster from which we're very unsure even how it will be remedied in the future. It's just a um, real nightmare environmental scenario. Uh, 
Similarly, if you look at uh, the BP Deepwater Horizon oil spill in the Gulf of Mexico, um, the you know um, investigation, a regulator investigation, found that uh, part of the part of the blame really was around cost cutting decisions made by BP and its partners, uh, including. Um, not properly cementing off the um, the wellhead, not properly monitoring the readings, not properly doing the maintenance and so on. And that led to the situation of an explosion and consequently um, the sinking of the well, the loss of life and this enormous oil spill uh, that continues to have uh, terrible consequences uh, for the environment and for livelihoods in the Gulf of Mexico. So more generally speaking, we can see many instances when firms uh, avoid costs by moving to countries where there are less regulations. It's kind of this race to the bottom for environmental regulations. And so we see situations where if a firm has to um, use a certain input process or pay for remediation of their waste or dispose it in a certain way and so on. If they can go to another location where it's possible to avoid those costs by dumping it into the river instead, for example, um, some firms will inevitably uh, take that in order to maximize profit. So lots of difficult situations then about the profit maximizing motivation for firms leading them to do things that are not um, socially beneficial, even if they're good for the firm and its shareholders. So that those were examples of where firms kind of purposefully and deviously perhaps um, tried to avoid costs um, in order to make greater profit. But there's also kind of other situations and perhaps even more common about where the full costs of operating and producing are not really adequately captured in what you know either us as you know consumers and and producers and so on um, actually occur so let me give you some examples so so maybe it's an example of um, you know the the freight train that goes by with the coal and it causes, uh, you know, as it, as it rolls down the track through communities and so on, dust comes off and ends up um, causing dust pollution in local communities. And that's quite common. Um, or perhaps it's a, you know, poultry operation and um, for, and there's no requirement that the, you know, that anything needs to be done in terms of odor and so on but for the uh, people that live around the poultry farm there's a very pungent you know odor from that manure or perhaps it's uh, you know the application of of a pesticide or a fertilizer onto crops and so on and it ends up a certain proportion of that ends up going into the water or maybe onto the great barrier reef and causes environmental damage um, but even you know for us individually as drivers and so on when we drive our cars there is um, greenhouse gases, gas emissions we release. There's um, you know traffic congestion we cause. There's accidents that occur and so on. So there is these costs that are occurring to society as a whole that aren't reflected in the um, in the overall cost that we have to pay to undertake those activities, and that is really what an externality is. So an externality is a positive or negative, often negative, consequence of an economic activity that's experienced by those outside of that transaction, if you will. So I drive my car, I release greenhouse gases, it affects the climate, the climate changes, it affects the entire world. That's an example of, and, and I'm not really paying for the costs of damage from my um, tailpipe emissions uh, on the greater world. So that's an example of an externality. And so you have the situation, we'll call it market failure, where an unregulated market fails to produce an outcome that is most beneficial to society as a whole. So two kind of key concepts there, externalities and market failures. And let's look at that in more detail. So here's a diagram you haven't seen before. So on this axis here, the vertical one, I have the amount of pollution that is discharged um, from a production process and the amount that's assimilated by the environment. So we could imagine, you know, this, for instance, could be greenhouse gas emissions um, 
you know, a power plant reduces greenhouse gas emissions, and but a certain, at a certain rate um, and a certain uh, different types of gases, they are assimilated into the atmosphere and rendered neutral and don't cause any problems. Or if you can imagine you have a pesticide application as in the previous example, or maybe I'll, I'll switch it over and say, imagine you have a livestock operation. Um, so you have a field with some cattle in it and it's close to a river. Um, and the, a certain amount of the manure that is you know, occurring on the field uh, when it rains washes into the river. We can imagine if the quantities are very low of that manure, it's likely just to be you know, naturally assimilated by the uh, river and rendered harmless and not cause any consequences. But after a certain point, um, there will be such a concentration of manure that ends up in the river that it actually exceeds the you know the, the natural ability of the river to assimilate that waste and then we get uh, consequences and that's represented in this diagram here so here we can see this is the emissions and you can think of that as you know could be um, emissions like greenhouse gas emissions and atmospheric assimilative capacity it could be uh, waste you know related emissions it could be heat of a um, you know of a of a cooling process for a plant that's going back into a water body um, you know hot water that's being returned back to a water body so we have this idea of emissions are increasing with the quantity of output produced so if we have more cattle on the farm there is more emissions being discharged at some point they exceed this assimilative capacity of the environment and that is in fact at this point QA the quantity a of assimilative capacity so what occurs after that point well then we get external costs this is this relationship to externalities so up until this point QA there is no damage to the environment because the environment can successfully uh, assimilate those wastes but past that point A then the marginal costs that is the cost uh, to society of each additional unit produced are increasing like this. So, and in fact, that leads to our next curve here, uh, which is um, which represents the private costs and the social costs together in the same curve. So you can see up until this point of output here, QA, the private costs, you know, for example, what I'm paying to drive my car, uh, and the cost to society are exactly the same. Um, for instance, here it's like what the f cost of the farmer to operate the cattle farm and the cost to society are the same. Um, but past that point of assimilative capacity then, those external costs, which we identified here, we add those on to the private costs and we get this new marginal social cost curve. So this is this idea of this divergence um, between what the individual ends up paying and then the additional costs that society ends up uh, incurring because of that. And you can see that society's costs are higher because society's costs also include the individual. So even, you know, for example, when I'm uh, driving my car and releasing greenhouse gas emissions, um, all of the costs associated with me operating the car are my private costs. And in addition, I'm suffering as part of society from uh, the damage that's caused by uh, that activity. So uh, let's stack these on top of each other perhaps and if you give the micro font here and you can go back and see what the graphs are but emissions and assimilative capacity so when we pass QA the quantity associated with you know exceeding the assimilative capacity here we have these external costs and now uh, you can see in this diagram here, uh, QA, that is the point where uh, marginal private costs and marginal social costs diverge. So you might imagine another situation where uh, the assimilated capacity was extremely low for a pollutant, in fact, perhaps even zero, which is to say that the very first unit of output, um, the emissions associated with that for for, for example highly toxic you know um, long-term persistent 
uh, pollutants and so on. Uh, what that is saying is when the assimilated capacity is zero, the external cost would start immediately and the marginal social costs would diverge from the private costs, you know, right at the, you know, from the origin there. Okay, now what I'd like to, to do is um, give another example here about externalities and um, show you in terms of the supply and demand curves. So let's talk about the market for automobiles. And this is a, a great example from uh, one of my favorite textbooks. It's Harris Roach uh, textbook on environmental and resource economics. So here we have a demand supply curve, uh, price cost on the vertical axis and the quantity on the horizontal axis. And in fact, what we have here is the quantity of automobiles that are produced and consumed. Now you can imagine that of course we get benefits these are uh, marginal benefits that's related to the demand curve. We get benefits from consuming automobiles and there's a cost to provide them. So pretty standard so far in terms of supply and demand. Uh, reach market equilibrium at a price uh, with a subscript M for the market uh, equilibrium price and a quantity um, market quantity equilibrium there too. But as I mentioned, there is external costs and uh, in this example, uh, referencing some research that was done by Perry et al., who found that uh, the external costs can be broken down for automobile use, and the categories they used here were climate change-related external costs, local pollution, um, accidents, uh, oil dependency, traffic congestion, and other costs. So they estimated that in the U.S., based on the data, that for every um, mile traveled by the car, there were approximately 10.9 cents of external cost, and in Europe was slightly lower, around nine. So what that is effectively saying then is that the costs of operating an automobile are higher, that the true cost of society are higher than these private marginal costs. And specifically, we can, we can add them on here and say, well, they're, you know, the the full social marginal costs, which is includes both the private costs and the external costs, are higher than just the private marginal costs. So this is our initial equilibrium here um, at this price and quantity, but you can see actually that it's not socially optimal. If we fully take into account all of the externalities, then we should be looking at this full you know, social marginal cost curve instead of the private one. So it would be more socially optimal to consider, well, where are you know, the benefits to society equal to the true full cost to society? And that's at this point here, this social optimum, which is at a lower quantity um, than is currently occurring. So you can see the difference between these two curves is the external costs. So how, you know, how would we calculate this and so on and what might we do to try to move from this market equilibrium to this social optimum well one possibility would be to impose a tax um, to what we call internalize the externality so how would it work in this case so in this particular example it would be a tax on manufacturers of automobiles so for every car that a company produces, they have to pay a tax. How much would that tax be? Well, we would want to incorporate the full external costs associated with that car. And I guess how we would do that is to um, average out the number of miles that a car um, drove in its life and then multiply that by you know 10 cents per mile. And for every car, then we would add on that total amount as the tax, right? That the firm would have to pay, uh, the car producing firm would have to pay to the government and uh, to fully internalize that. And how would, you know, how would that change the nature of uh, the outcome then? Well, we can see that if the company had to pay the full costs of the environmental damage and other damage associated with its product, then it would operate on this new higher cost curve, right? The cost curve has moved up because you've got all its original cost plus the tax um, per car that uh, it's producing. So the costs curve is higher now. 
So um, with a higher cost then, um, the firm would require a higher price to, you know, if it were at, still at this quantity, would require a higher price to uh, cover those costs. That hasn't occurred. So what actually happens then is um, partly the firm ends up paying some of that cost and partly it passes it on to consumers. So you can see in this outcome here, the equilibrium of the tax, um, the price has gone up. Consumers have paid part of that additional uh, cost that was put onto the firms and the outcome and then the firm ends up paying the other part. And the outcome is that the quantity that the market would have produced originally then is reduced down to this socially optimal level instead. So that's actually called a Pigovian tax after I think it's Arthur Pigov uh, who, who first really postulated this uh, idea about um, adding on a tax that is exactly equal to the external costs of, um, of the product um, per unit and that would change the um, change the nature of the firm's response and the uh, consumer response to produce a social optimal. Okay, well, let's consider a different example. So in this example, I have, um, and it again, it comes from the same Harris Roach textbook, uh, I have, we have the solar energy, the market for solar energy. Now, in this case, there's actually a positive externality from solar energy. And that relates to uh, lower greenhouse gas emissions, lower air pollution, and so on. So there is a desirable, you know, objective around solar energy. Uh, but the price that consumers pay uh, is still the same, effectively. They don't get the benefits um, that is occurring from their provision of solar energy. So if I put solar... Um, solar panels on my rooftop, I pay a certain amount to do that. I'm not actually capturing the additional positive externalities that are occurring for, you know, all of society because I took that action and now there's less air pollution. So here we have uh, my own private, private benefits here, or the, you know, the benefits to um, private uh, people who are uh, purchasing the solar panels. We still have the cost of producing them from companies, so that's the company supply curve. But we have the true social benefits here. These social marginal benefits are higher than um, just the individual's private benefits. So without any intervention in this market, the market equilibrium will be here, where um, the private cost of production equal you know, the private benefits. That's the intersection of demand and supply as we know it at this market price and this market quantity. But as we said before, the, the true um, social benefit curve is higher. Uh, so it would be preferable then if we were producing and consuming more of the solar energy than we are. So what is one possible policy response? Well, one thing, and it's similar, but the reverse of the tax is to provide a subsidy. So if instead uh, we were able to provide a subsidy, uh, and in this case, we're subsidizing the cost of, um, presumably the cost of manufacturing these. Uh, the producer then will produce more of them. And the new equilibrium outcome will be that the price falls uh, because of the subsidy and the quantity uh, increases. And in fact, there will be a, you know, in both of these examples, there's a in the example of a tax, it's partly borne by the producers and partly borne by the consumers. And you can investigate that with the producer surplus and consumer surplus. And, and similarly, in terms of a subsidy, there's a partially it's a, um, a benefit in, on the producer surplus and partly a benefit on the, on the consumer surplus. So those are two examples about how um, a, a regulator, the government, could intervene to try to achieve a socially optimal outcome uh, in the presence of an externality, positive or negative. So just in terms of self-review then, that would be useful for you to do, let's start with the revenue cost profit area. Why is the marginal revenue of a product equal to its price? Think about that. Um, explain the relationship between total revenue, total cost and total profit. And then equally, the relationship between marginal revenue, marginal cost, and marginal profit. Uh, 
and um, it should be able to draw a marginal cost curve and a marginal revenue curve and explain the profit maximizing output for a firm uh, and why that is the case, why they wouldn't want to produce more or less. Uh, then talk about what happens if the price of the product, the marginal revenue goes up or down, uh, and what happens if the firm's marginal costs uh, go up or down, the uh, curve shifts up or down or uh, left or right as you wish. In terms of external costs and market failure, uh, it would be good for you to use a graph to explain the relationship between the level of output, the quantity of emissions, and the assimilative capacity of the environment, and then talk about um, different you know, situations where assimilative capacity might be higher or lower, relate that to uh, the output at which you know, marginal costs occur, uh, the output at which uh, social and private costs diverge, and to talk about you know, what is the socially optimal level of output. Is there positive externalities? Do they occur? You know, how would you show that on a graph with marginal social and marginal private costs? So on? Um, and then use graphs to explain how a tax or subsidy could be used to produce a socially optimal outcome. Okay, so that's about it for this um, video on external costs and market failure and self-review. Hope you found that useful, and I'll see you in another video. Thanks for your time.